Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Zoom seminar by the Golden Pathway. We were designed to share teachings of the Ascended Masters with people who are trying to learn different aspects of the path to the Ascension. We've had, we've had years where we focused on psychology, health, prosperity, and this year we are focusing on increasing your light in the world. And our presenter today is Anne Bethel out of Australia. And she is going to tell us more about the Kabbalah and the Tree of Life. So we're going to discover today some of the hidden gifts that God concealed in the Kabbalah as she demystifies this ancient doctrine. We will explore God's purpose in creation, the Ten Spirot, the Palm Tree of Deborah, God's School for Angels, and the Secrets of Our Lord's Prayer. So we're going to learn how to climb this tree of light to our own individual victories. Now, Anne has been a keeper of the flame since 1985. She was born in England on a, and raised on a street called Camelot. Can you believe that? She now lives in Bendigo, northwest of Melbourne, Australia, and has traveled extensively throughout Ireland, Europe, and the Middle East. She also lived and worked with the Bedouins in Arabia and has been a nurse in the wilds of Papua New Guinea. Anne gives frequent Zoom presentations to groups in Australia and New Zealand based on her in-depth knowledge of Kabbalah. In the 90s, she presented Elizabeth Clare Prophet with a large chart of the I Am Presence that she embroidered. She's a much loved grandmother to a large extended clan of children of all ages. And Anne, we're happy to have you with us today. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. We're excited. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, I'm excited too. <laughs> Great. Shall we go? Absolutely. Okay. Well, first of all, we'll just share a screen. And then just bear with me for a moment while we get into this and get into the slideshow. And... There we go. Just bear with me while I get a pointer. Okay. Well, thank you folks for coming today and for tuning in and sharing Kabbalah. It really is a wonderful thing to share. And it's a simple thing when you learn to understand the principles one at a time and just simply. Now, a lady called Elizabeth Clare Prophet wrote a book and she, in that book, she wrote, uh, those who wrote the scriptures were inserting verbal puzzles that could only be solved by those to whom the keys were given. Only those who had all the pieces and some of those pieces can only be found in Kabbalah. Not all of them, but some of those pieces can be found in Kabbalah. And of the different things that she was talking about, we have a look at some of the keys today. Now, when you see a little hand appear with a leaf in it or a plant. This means that this particular screen coming up is a handout, which Linda has organized for you afterwards, I believe. So you don't need to scribble a lot of notes when you see that particular icon on the screen. So we'll look at some of the keys that are in Kabbalah. Now, we won't be discussing these today, but some of these things are what made Kabbalah so mysterious. Well, Kabbalah teaches us that there were two Adams and there were two creations. Adam Kadmon was in the first creation and Adam Harishan is Adam of Eden. For the purposes of referral, when I'm speaking about Adam of Eden, I will simply call him Adam of Eden as opposed to Adam Kadmon. But Kabbalah teaches that there were two and there were two creations in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter two, and two different Adams. Also, the name of Jesus is found in Kabbalah more than once. His actual name is mentioned more than once in Kabbalah, which is just wonderful because Kabbalah was written so many hundreds of years ago. And this is our energy coming from below and going up to God. And that is our energy from God coming down to us. 
And that, of course, forms the Sixth Star of David, which is a Hebrew symbol. And Rabbi Isaac Ako on, in the 13th century taught that the earth is 15 billion years old. He taught that in the 13th century. That's quite an amazing thing because when you think about it, modern science has only just caught up with them. It was only in the last hundred years that the scientists told us that the earth was anything between nine and 16 billion years old. And there is Rabbi, Iacocco, uh, sorry, Rabbi Isaac of Akoko in the 13th century telling us that. That's another one of the mysteries of Kabbalah. Also, the origins of evil are explored in Kabbalah, where they give five or six different reasons for the origin of evil. And most importantly is joy, to rejoice. When the Israelites came out of the desert, God asked them to make a, a thing called a Sukkot, S-U-C-C-O-T, which is a hut around which they had a festival. And it was a prerequisite that they rejoiced, that they enjoyed the festival and they had joy in their hearts to give gratitude to God for delivering them from 430 years captivity and 40 years in the desert. So hopefully we'll have a little bit of joy today. The Red Sea was actually an initiation, and it was to pre prepare all Israelites to receive the mysteries of the tree of life. Now, that's very important because it was to receive all Israelites, every man, woman, and child. At this particular point in time, it was not a secret doctrine. It became a secret doctrine because of the persecution that the Kabbalists suffered. And so it went underground and is now thankfully re-emerging. So you also have come to learn about the Tree of Life, and that is just wonderful. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, indeed. Now, Isaac Luria, and we'll speak about him in just a moment, wrote about Etch Chime, which is the Tree of Life. And he said God's purpose, when it arose in his will to create the universe and to bestow good to his handiwork, that they may recognize his greatness, and become a worthy vehicle for the supernal to cleave to him and by which he himself might also be known and loved. Now, cleave is an old English word. And what it means is to grasp and then having grasped, hang on for dear life, literally for dear life, to cleave to him above all others, because then he himself will be known and loved. When we choose of our own free will to grasp him through the spherot and to cleave to him, then and he himself might be known and loved. That was God's purpose. This is, of course, the map of the world, and the red cross in the center represents Israel. And here we have Israel in close up. And on the top here, we have a little village called Sfat. It's pronounced S F A T, but spelt Safed. And here there was an enclave of extremely qualified rabbis and masters who studied Kabbalah. They came from all over the world due to the persecution, particularly in Spain, but all over Europe. And they collected at Sfat just here. And just south of there, there was another collection of very holy people called the Ascends. Now, Jesus was an Asen of, of the tribe of the Ascends. And they, the two were close together, literally within a few miles of each other. This is the Sea of Galilee, and there is Nazareth. So it was a long way for a lady on a donkey to come all the way down to Bethlehem and to Jerusalem, but she did it. Thank goodness that she did that. And it was a long way. This is mountainous territory. And on the way, there is a place called Ramah. And here there is a palm tree of Deborah. Now, the palm tree of Deborah is a very important symbol in Kabbalah. It occurs many, many times, too many times to be mentioned uh, in number as such, but it's very important. So we'll be talking a little bit today about the palm tree of Deborah and about the commune of people in Sfat in Israel in the 13th century that started. The Palm Tree of Deborah is also a book, and it was a book written by Mo, Rabbi Moses Cordovero, who was born and died in Sfat, 
and he died at the age of 48 years. When he died, Rabbi Isaac Luria took over. Now it is from him, from this gentleman here, that we get most of the knowledge that we have today because this was Isaac Luria, didn't, although he didn't write very much himself, he did write a few very important texts, but his disciples wrote volumes on what he had taught them during his lifetime. And he in turn handed down to Rabbi Joseph Caro. Now here we have a palm tree. It's probably not the one that is connected with Deborah, but a palm tree in symbology is very important because it has no branches. And therefore the energy can go from the earth straight up to the fronds at the top. And conversely, the energy of God can come straight down the palm tree. It has no branches. All of its leaves or fronds come from a central crown in there, which is known as the heart of the palm tree. In Hebrew, that is lulav. And lulav is associated with one of the spherot, which we'll come to in just a tick. And it's the heart of all that there is. And Deborah sat underneath this palm tree. We'll learn a little bit about her later on and different things that she did. But the palm tree at Deborah is written in the Bible. It's written in the book of Judges, and it's written in many, many different areas. The palm tree itself uh, provides some shade, as you can see, and it has a sprout. And in France, the cord of palmier is actually a delicacy. And there is quite a commonality in Hebrew between the word palm and psalm. The two are very closely linked because, of course, in Hebrew, people read from right to left and there's no vowels. So some of the words do get a little bit mixed up. Now, when Isaac Luria told the story, he said that Ein Sof, whom we call God but for the time being, had a school for the angels. And he himself, Ein Sof, taught Kabbalah to a select company of her highest angels who formed a theosophic school in the celestial court of the Almighty in paradise. Now, Ein Sof is a name which is actually rather a description than a name. Ein means absolutely nothing, and Sof means unending, without limit. We will speak in a little while about a whirlwind, and it's called a Sofa, because a whirlwind is a world, is a wind that has no limit. It can cause in, incredible destruction. Iron Sof doesn't necessarily cause destruction, but he is a nothingness of which is unlimited. But some matters were not revealed, even to the highest angels. Ein Sof is nothingness without limit. Sof is without limit. And there, from there, Kabbalah was handed down. Oh, sorry, I missed a bit. Beg your pardon. This is Adam. Adam, when he was cast out from the Garden of Eden, it is said that God took mercy on him because he was cast out. And God sent an angel called Raziel, the keeper of the secrets of God, to give Adam a book. Now, this is the artist's impression of uh, Archangel Raziel. And if you look at the carefully at these lines here, they are basically the lines that we'll be talking about in the Spherot shortly. And you'll see that Raziel there has a book. So God sent Archangel Raziel, the keeper of the secrets of God, to give Adam a book so that he may regain entry into the Garden of Paradise eventually, and to remember that he was made in the image of God the divine face, which was then handed down by oral tradition through Kabbalah. And through that line, that is, first of all, the school of angels, and then through Adam himself, through Archangel Raziel, then it was handed to Enoch. And Enoch, in turn, handed it to Melchizedek and taught Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, in turn, taught Abraham. And Abraham, uh, in his incarnation as Valmoria Khan, built the wonderful Taj Mahal for his beloved. And at this point in time, we're just going to look at some of the older books of Kabbalah and where they came from, because they are mentioned. The books of Kabbalah, the oldest one that we know of that is in print today, there are texts which are just not available that are older than this, is called the Bahair. 
And it was written by Rabbi Nehuniah, and that was approximately in the 12th to the 13th century. The exact date is not known. The second oldest book is the Sefer Yetzira. Sefer means book in Hebrew, Yetzira means the universe of angels, and it was written by Abraham. And the last one we'll talk, be talking about is called the Zohar by Rabbi Moses de Leon. And the Zohar is a compilation of the Bahe, the Sefer Yeritza, and many other texts all compiled together in the Zohar. Now, there are actually two aspects of God. There is God as he is and God of the Bible. God as he is, we know as Ein Sof, the first cause. And you'll notice there's a little handout here uh, on the little hand up the top there. Is omnipotent and omniscient, infinite or present, above time, space and knowing, the absolute unity and unchanging, lacking nothing. But this is the most important line here. He is utterly beyond human comprehension. When all else fails and you figure you can't understand it, remember, it is utterly beyond human comprehension. That's why we like to label things. And we labeled the things in the Bible. We labeled God as the all wise creator, the understanding one. And all of that list there, all of that list is names that we put on the actions of God, like he is a protector and a provider. Is the kingship just and true? These are names that we gave to God because we were trying to understand him, to get back to him. So when Ein Sof decided that he would like to make a creation for the purposes that we just discussed earlier, he had to do several different things. The first one is that he created a spherot. And a spherot is a circle of his own essence, Ein Sof's essence, encased in a chiffon carapace. This is a coating just here. The reason for that was if you could imagine in your mind that all of this white here is Ein Sof, if he didn't put a little bit of his essence <clears throat> in a casing, it would immediately return to him because it would be part of him. God is the absolute unity. And he had to separate a little bit of his essence from him himself. And he did this by this marvelous garment, which is created all the way around there and keeps the innards in and the outards out and separates it, forms that barrier. <clears throat> and Ein Sof actually made 10 of these spherot. And the sphere, by the way, one spherot is called sephirot, just there. 10 of them are called sephiroth, but they're pronounced spheroth or spherot, just there. So the spherot were the tools for God. Everything that God created, bar nothing, was created by the spherot under God's instructions. They were the tools that he used to create absolutely everything. But they are also the gifts that he gave to us that he knew we would need to get back to him. Because in his mind, when he created the universe, and it's not for me to try and understand what God would or wouldn't do, but the evidence is there that he already had a plan for us to get back to him right from the very beginning. They were the gifts that he knew we would need to get back to him. The sphere are all different. They're separate. They're all giving, they all receive, they're all balanced, and they all move constantly. They are never still. They shimmer, they shake, they get very excited. And if God gives an edict, for example, let there be light, the shim, the sphere art just rush like a whirlwind. They just dash to do his bidding. And then when they're finished, they go back to their place. For the purposes of continuity on this presentation, I'll be using the colors of the chakras on most of the charts, not on all of them. The sphere art do have, according to the Zohar, their own color scheme, but it differs depending on which, which version of the Zohar that you read. So for continuity, I've chosen to use the chakra colors, which are given by Elizabeth Clare Prophet in her book, Kabbalah, The Key to Your Inner Power. Now, here is our first spherot again. This is Keter, just here. And when Ein Sof had created Keter, he then went on to make nine more, and he put the nine inside Keter. 
So it was a bit like each little one had their own carapace. Here's Kite, he has everything with inside him. And Einsoff has put all of the little one, two, three, four, five, one, two to 10 here, because number one is out there. It's rather like making falafel or rice balls. If you have a little ball of food, it will fall apart if it's not held together. Now, this, of course, is not what God did, but it's a similarity, is that if you take a little ball of food, you wrap it in a little bit of cling wrap to keep it all together, and you put it on a plate and pop it in the fridge. Well, that's basically the same idea. The other nine sphere op being in side Kite also could not run straight back to Ein Sof. He kept them all together within the fine confines of Kite. The next thing Ein Sof did was he built three columns. The first column, and notice it is the first one, is equilibrium called balance. The second one is mercy. And the third one is judgment. Now, this is very important to note that mercy came before judgment, but before mercy came balance. Balance was the key. These columns are also known as balance, male and female. Now, I do understand that in our society today, we normally associate male with the blue color, but in Kabbalah, they don't follow the rules. Ein Sof arranged his spherot on the three columns according to their individual designations. So here's Kiter, there's number one, the one we've already spoken about, and Kiter is associated with the crown. Now we are at the bottom of this column, right down the bottom here. When we do good in our world, the energies go up through the, through the spherot to Kiter, and the crown rises towards Ein Sof. But when things are not going so well, the crown will lower. It is advantageous to have the crown higher and not touching Kiter. Isaac Luria said, the unlimited joy of doing God's will is all it is. Or you can say it is all, because within Kite are nine other spherot. So it is all because it has everything within inside it. But it's a simple thing. It is the joy of doing God's will. Isn't that just beautiful? The second spherot that Einsoff emanated is called Hokmar. And he represents wisdom, but it's undifferentiated wisdom, unallocated wisdom. It's just wisdom, just as it is. And the third one is Bina, which is understanding. So we'll have a closer look at Kite. And again, it's a little mark. There is a handout for this one. So um, just follow the slide and you'll see how it works. Ein Sof is said to be negative existence is unmanifest, absolute divine nothingness. Negative existence is that which is there, but cannot be seen, like the wind. We know when the wind is there because the trees move. Sometimes we can feel it. Sometimes it's actually quite painful. And sometimes we can touch it when we can feel the, the wind going through our fingers, but we can't see it. And we, we know it's there by the effect it has on other things. Kite, as you'll notice, is a little bit darker because the further you get away from Ein Sof, the less light there is, and that gives a different color. This is Kite. This is the first sphere just here. And one side of Kite is relevant to Ein Sof, and Ein Sof gives his energy to negative existence, to part of Kite. But there is another side of Kite too, which is said to be positive existence, because we do know the effect of this one, because Kite communicates with and is affected by both Hokmar and Bina. And this is positive existence. Now, we can't actually see it. We can only see the effects that it does. Now, there is no line in Kite, but for the purposes of our diagram, I've drawn a line here. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn Kite around so that we can only see this face, so that we can no longer see Ein Sof. The reason for this is uh, there is a saying that says no man shall see God and live as man. You have to be elevated then to the realms of the holy if you wish to live. Ein Sof, therefore, is hidden. And he's behind Kite. So we'll turn it around so that now we see 
this face only. Like looking at the moon. We know there's another side to the moon. We call it the dark side of the moon. Ein Sof is not a dark side at all, but he's hidden behind there just as we don't see the other side of the moon. And Kiter is representative of the right side, the front side. This is the side we are working with. And the right side only has one eye. Is in, in Kabbalah, it's known as the superior eye. The eye, note it's not plural, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. And of course, we have Cyclopeia, and on your banknotes and on the pyramids, there is Cyclopeia, which we get the word from Cyclops, which is a Greek word meaning the center of the forehead. I don't know which one or whether they are the same or whether there's a connection between the two. But this teaching here is so old from the time of Melchizedek, the teaching of the eye being in the center of the forehead is really quite recent. Whether they are one and the same, I can't say. But that is Kiter and that is Kiter's function, to be very close to Ein Sof, to hide the side of Ein Sof that is dangerous to us and to present to us his right side only. And in presenting that right side, he does so in a subtle whisper, very gentle, not forceful at all. So we have Kiter followed by Hakma, followed by Bino. Now, when Ein Sof emanated Kiter, Kiter then emanated Hakma, and then Kiter emanated Bino, and he sent across the remaining seven spherot from himself to Bino. So now we're, we've just looked at Kiter there. Now we're going to have a look at Hakma. Hakma is the will to create. All of creation is contained within Hokmar. Every little fairy, every little pixie, every drop of dew, every blade of grass is already within Hokmar. It is the will to create. And it is undifferentiated wisdom. So it's not necessarily useless to us, but we can't use it in that form because it's not been allocated. It's undifferentiated wisdom. Whereas Bina is the doer. Bina has the details of all created things actualized in divine thought. So Hokma gets the good ideas, Bina puts them into action. Bina is also known as the Great Mother because she gave birth to seven children, which were the remaining seven spherot. And she did it in a very special way. So back to our original chart just here, Kite, Hokma. And now Hokmar, as you can see, has moved to the middle channel, middle of equilibrium. This colored area here is called the meeting place. And Bina also comes down to the meeting place. And when Bina and Hokmar are together, they are said to be conjoined as a mother and father would be conjoined. And from this position, not from that one, from this position here, Bina then emanates the next seven spherot. This little gray area, this beige area here is also called Dahat, but Dahat is not a spherot. It's a quasi spherot. It's a meeting place. So we look at Bina now. These are the first three spherot, and they are also called a triad because there are three of them. Hakma works as the male, Bina, the female, in opposition to each other, but also together like this. And Kite is the balance. Kite brings the balance between the two, and he tells the whole lot what to do. He's the numero uno, Ancho. They are direct emanations from Ein Sof, whereas the rest of the emanations, the following seven, are not direct emanations from Ein Sof. They are born of Bina. They are emanations, but they are not direct. We don't know if this happens slowly over time or if it was instant, like a big bang. We really don't know. We do know that with the big bang, there was a lot of destruction. And we also know that Bina was not damaged at all. She was enhanced by giving birth to the next seven sphere odd. So we have again, first triad is Kite, Hokma, and Bina. We have a meeting place where they meet together. And then Bina emanated Hesed. Then she emanated Gavura, and then she emanated T. 
Tiferet. And those three form the second triad or the second group. Very important, the one in the center, because they help bring the balance between the two. Now, Hesed is known for mercy. And the easiest way to remember Hesed is Santa Claus, because Hesed is one of those who gives and gives to the detriment of everything that they do. Hesed would give to actually dampen, to actually de be a detriment to the rest of the spherot. And Hesed is also the dampener down of Gavura. Now, Gavura over here is known as justice. In the extreme form, it has a second name, Dean is the second name. When the judgments are given and they are extreme judgments, then this spherot is called Dean. Gavura is for justice. And it is Gavura that dampens down Hesed and says, okay, dad, that's enough giving for now. Let's just cool it a bit. And it's Hesed in his role who dampens down Gavura when Gavura slips into the Din mode, Dean mode. And it is Gavura who is dampened down by Hesed. The two work together under the auspices of Tiferet. And Tiferet, number six, is beauty. And Tiferet is known as the place of the sun, S-O-N, and Jesus the mediator. He's also known as the husband of Malkut, who is down here, whom we haven't got to. When Ein Sof recognizes that the judgments are too severe, he can order through Kiter and through Tiferet for Hesed to increase the mercy to dampen down the Gavura. Now, this is very interesting because Moses was born perfect, according to Kabbalah. And in that perfection, he had the attainment to call down the 13 attributes of mercy, and he did that. In the Old Testament, when judgment was given, it was almost nearly always instant because uh, there was no mediator between the two. So when judgments were given, they were normally quite extreme. And Moses had the ability when the children of Israel did something wrong and a new judgment was coming, he could use the names of God and call down the 13 attributes of mercy, and that would dampen down Gavura and take Din back to being justice. The karma still had to be paid, the judgment still had to be, be done, but they were done as justice rather than being judgment. Now, God needs judgment, He uses it to punish the wicked to test mankind and to give man a choice. How could we choose to go back to God unless we had two things to choose from? And the judgment shows us that which is not acceptable to God and that which is acceptable to God and therefore gives us a choice. And we have a wonderful example of the union between Hesed and Gavura, which was given to us by El Moria. And he said, if you have an evildoer, particularly within the family environment, somebody who's very close to you, then you can use hesed. This is hesed, mercy. Your first step is to use divine mercy, invoke vote the law of divine mercy for the forgiveness of the soul of the evildoer. Not the evildoer himself, but the soul of the evildoer. And then hesed, uh, sorry, then gavura is the second step of invoking the law of divine justice for the judgment of the not self of the evildoer. That makes you feel better because you've actually been able to do something to be able to act. And it's the perfect example of how the two work together. The divine mercy that was born first, and that's why the heart is a little bit higher than the diamond on its side here. And it's born a bit, little bit higher, was born first, and there is closer to God. Mercy came before justice. And now we'll have a look at the third triad. So Binar now will emanate Netshak, it's prophecy and victory. She will also emanate Hod, which is prophecy and majesty. And then Binar will emanate Yesod down here. So Netshak is victory and prophecy. And Hod is majesty and prophecy. And Yesod is something entirely different. Yesod is the foundation of everything of all souls when joined with Malkut. And Yesod is the righteous one. Whenever you see in Kabbalah or anywhere else the words written, the righteous one, they are speaking of Yesod. Yesod supports all the world. He sustains it, makes it grow, increases, watches it, is beloved and dear, fearsome and mighty, 
rectified and accepted both on high and below. And that's a quote from the Bar Hair, the oldest printed book that we have. And we have an example of Netshach and prophecy. And that example is Deborah. Now, Deborah is on the earth down here below the level of Malkut, but she had the ability, the same as Moses did, she had the attainment when it was called for to climb up through Malkut and then go to either Netshach or Hod for prophecy, or she could go up to Yesod and then go to Netshach or to Hod. And she was the prophet of Israel. And true prophecy is only attained by that route. There are a lot of false prophets out there. It is very difficult to climb up through Malkut and Yesod unless you have the attainment to do so, to reach the levels of prophecy, which is Hod and Netshach. So this is Deborah. This is not her husband. This is Barak just here. And there's the inevitable palm tree at the background. Now, Deborah was a judge, a prophetess, a battle strategist, well-respected, beloved grandmother, and she was married to a gentleman called Lapidoth. She was a judge in the high court of Israel. Together with Barak, a army partner, she was a battle strategist. She prophesied the outcome and won many battles for Israel because they didn't go to battle unless Deborah said they were likely to win it. And that's a quote from the book of Judges. She dwelt under a palm tree. She didn't just go and visit there. She actually lived under the palm tree between Bethel and Ramah in Ephraim. And the children of Israel came to her for judgment. Now, around that area, the tribe of Benjamin settled when the children of Israel came to the promised land. And just like the rest of us, there were squabbles, there were fights over land and over stock. And Deborah chose to leave the high court and go and live under a palm tree. Lapidoth, her husband, was a very wealthy man. She could have done anything with her life, but she chose to live under a palm tree and so that she could help the people. She wanted to work with the people at the lower level in a lower court and under a palm tree people would see her they she would sometimes recline on a couch when prophecy was called for she wouldn't leave the tree she would just simply close her eyes and go into a meditative pose and climb up through the spherot and prophesy what would be the result if the people did this whether it was a result of their squabbles or whether it was actually to do with a battle Climbing up through the tree is what we are all destined to do to get back to God. The last sphere that we'll look at, number 10, is called Malkut. Malkut is a very special um, sphere -ot. She is called the Divine Mother. She's part of cause and effect. She has the Shekinah glory and the Chasmal, which is a protective garment. She's known as the wife of Tiferet, and she was the cause of one of Adam's sins. According to Kabbalah, Adam had three different sins. He adored Malkut to the exclusion of all else and caused a separation of Malkut and her Shekinah, and they were cast down to lower levels. And even today, Hebrew people pray for the reunion of Malkut and her husband. Husband Tiferet. Elizabeth Clare Prophet in her book, Kabbalah, Key to Your Inner Power, states that this was a cosmic catastrophe when Malkut was exiled. Malkut is the womb of all souls. And when Jesus said, I am the door which no man can shut, he was referring to Malkut, the doorway by which we go back to God himself. Now, Dahat is the tree of knowledge. And it's also in the chakra tree, it's the secret chamber of the heart. And how to explain the hat is simply by a, a little, this is Australia, of course, we have Darwin up the top and Adelaide at the bottom, and there's a one road which runs for 3,534 kilometers north and south, and approximately in the middle just here, there's an intersection. There's nothing at that intersection except a garage for petrol or a gas station. There's a road leading off to the left here to the west, which is Uluru or um, Ayers Rock, as you may know it, and the name of this little garage here is called Garn. It's named after the Afghan Camelias who came out to Australia. This wasn't on the map. I had to draw this on the map, and this is what it looks like today. Kiter and the north would be up here, going south down the highway that way, or going west to Ayers Rock here. And all that is there 
is that gas station. Very important because there's no other gas for miles, thousands of kilometers away. There's a motel, but there's no alcohol. There's no church. It's not a town, but it is a very important meeting place. You can camp in these areas here and wait overnight on your journey if you so desire and move on. And that's what the hut is. The hut is a meeting place, looks like a spherot, sometimes acts like a spherot, but is actually known for its knowledge. And the tree of knowledge, which was in the Garden of Eden, comes up through here. But it is basically its function is a meeting place. The hut is also the exterior expression of Keter, the meeting place of Hockman and Bina for many different functions, not just giving birth, there are many different functions there. It's known as the tree of knowledge and contains the secret chamber of the heart. One of the most critical things in the, in the chart, if not the most critical thing, is the balance. And you can imagine these to be a sphere, but if they were pans of gold, it would be appropriate to move some to the other until the balance bar was equal up the top here. That's called balance. Equilibrium is when we talk about the point of equipoise up the top here. The point of equipoise holds the balance and it is an absolute imperative in the tree. Without balance, there's another cosmic catastrophe. Now, Psalm 31 teaches us that Ein Soft produced his spherot and cause them to emanate his deeds. They are 10 words by which he works. We don't worship them. We don't adore them. We use them. They are words. And he used them for the actions he performs in the lower worlds. Remember that we cannot look at God. God cannot come down here and help us. He uses the spheros because those lower worlds are separate from him, but they have a communication with him because up through Kiter, on the top of Kiter is the crown, and on the top of that is Ein Sof. So there is a communication there. It is a flowing unity, up and down. Now, these are the names of God, and I, I'm not going to pronounce them now, but they all can all be found on the tape called Come Holy Dove, which I'm sure Patricia will tell you about shortly if, if, if there are questions on it. But the pathway up the mountain back to God, you can't run uphill. You can earn, earn the right, earn the attainment. You can learn. You can use the sphere art. You can experience them. You can explore with them. You can climb from them. You can call for a guide and you can show others the way. And it may well be when you first start to go up through Malcourt, that's as far as you get. That's fine. At least you're on the mountain going somewhere. And little bit by little bit, you earn the right to go up through the tree, as Deborah did to the level of prophecy, as Moses did to the level of Hesed and Bina. This is a bibliography, and up in the top of the bibliography up there, there is a list, and you do get a copy of this in the, um, <clears throat> in the handouts. There is a key to the pronunciation chart at the top there. And we're going to finish today with our Lord's Prayer, because this is so beautiful, is that Jesus was teaching us Kabbalah, even though we didn't know it, and even though we haven't used it. We, it this is Kabbalah. When we say our Father, we're talking about Ein Sof who art in heaven, that's Kiter. Hallowed be thy name, I am. Now, Kiter, the good name of God that is associated with Kiter, is I am that I am. I am thy kingdom come. The kingdom is Malkut. I am is Kiter. So there we have cause and effect. I am thy will, that's Hokmar, the will, being done, that's Bina. I am on earth, Malkut as I am in heaven. I am giving this day daily bread to all. This is Yesod, the all giver. I am forgiving all life this day, even, that's Tiferet, the compassionate one. I am also all life forgiving me, that's Hesed, mercy. I am leading all men away from temptation through my example of justice, Gavura. I am delivering all men from every evil condition. This is the glory. I am the kingdom, which is Malkut. I am the power, which is Hod. And the glory of God is the female aspect of God, Shekinah, that is found in Malkut. All of this I am, which is Kiter. 
Amen. Thank you, Patricia. We're there. <laughs> Amazing that you covered all that in 45 minutes. I am impressed. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. So questions, comments, reactions. Yeah. I have two questions. Go ahead, Paloma. Good evening, and thank you very much. It was very good. It was very good. I have read Mother's book several times, and I loved it. I loved the way that you went through it. I have two questions. One was uh, when you said um, that Ains of created the Sephiroth with the Chiffon carapace. I don't know what that is, if you can explain that. Chiffon is a material, okay. carapace is a covering. So it's a fine, it's when you see nylon and uh, something that's very fine, a material that's very fine, but very strong, like silk. And it's called a chiffon carapace because it's a, a binding that keeps it in, but it's a material. It doesn't break easily, but it does break. Yeah. So does it represent like the seamless garment for us? Or? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. And then the second question is about a little bit of biography. Um, you spoke about three books at the beginning. Are those the ones that you think are the best for us to read apart from Mother's book, um, Kabbalah? I think if, if you um, really want to be serious about, uh, about the books, The Wisdom of the Zohar, which is the one that Mother uses, is probably very deep. And it's, uh, this is my reference book too. It's very deep, and, but it's enthralling as to what is there. If you want to just start off with Kabbalah, then the Bar Hair, which is the oldest of all of the text, and they are in print in America today. And this is they do appear in your bibliography. The bar here is a relatively simple one to start with. That is after you've done Mother's Book, of course. And that is, that's the Sefer Yuritza, which is the, the story of the kingdom of angels. Those three, the Sefer Yuritza, and the bar here were written by the same author. And he writes in a very user-friendly manner. But if you want the deep stuff, then the wisdom of the Zohar, which is the text that Elizabeth Fair Prophet used, is the best one for the deep, deep stuff. Thank you. But you'll get it in your bibliography, those details. Thank you. You're welcome. Great question. Any other questions or comments for Anne? I think they're shell struck. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hopi said that was amazing and so clear. Really appreciate the journey you presented. Thanks. She put that in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think Stella has a question. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. <clears throat> Am I? Can you hear me? Yes, Rob. Yes. Oh, good. <clears throat> so when I first thought, saw the three that came together to birth the other, uh, Saro, uh, it seemed to me that it was like the emblem that El Moria uses for our church. And I don't know why I saw it like that, but it was so clear to me the three in one that made everything else. And I don't know if I just felt like it took me away to a higher place. Well, thank you very much. That, that's wonderful. And of course, Almoria gave us those three dots, didn't he? Yeah. And Almoria's I mean. badge, badge has the three dots on it. And those three dots uh, were indeed Dahat, Hockman, and Hockmar as they're coming together. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was fantastic. Because uh, because Elmoria being Abraham uh, had such an inner knowledge that when the teachings were passed to him undiluted and as he passes them down to us and little revelations like that are wonderful. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. I'm so grateful because I was on another uh, training that I have to do for my worldly occupation and the Holy Spirit said, you're missing the Zohar or you're missing the, uh, and I flipped it real quick. That's why I was a little late. <laughs> Thank you. We're glad you came, Sila. Yeah. Nice. Robin. Thank you. And how do you make a prayer? Like, do you start at Malhut or do you start at Kita? Or do you, does it depend what you want to ask for? If you want some healing or you want some outcome? How do you make <laughs> a prayer? 
Well, in Elizabeth Clare Prophet's book, The Key to Your Inner Power, I don't have the page number in front of me, but in that book, she gives a prayer to the spherot. And she says that we should use all of them, uh, not necessarily just one of them, because that's falling into the trap of idolatry, as indeed um, Adam did, but use the whole lot of them and then just specify one or two as you working through them. And it says, a year, Asher, a year, and it goes right the way through the entire lot and grant me peace and grant me this. And, and but it's in Mother's book. Hmm. And she also has a prayer written to each of the sphere of, in the back of that book. Yes, that's so the one I'm speaking about. Well. Yeah, she has one prayer where she names them all, but then she has prayers to each one as well. Great. Other questions? Did Joy, do you want to ask or say something? She's not moving. Uh, is that Helen Geddes? That's is her hand up. Okay. And Trinidad wants to know if the Kabbalah was written in Hebrew. And then we'll go to Helen. Originally, it was written Aramaic. And uh, there are many texts in the that say, do not trust the Hebrew version. Because the Aramaic version was the original one, but a lot of people came along and tried to, uh, for want of a better phraseology, jump on the bandwagon and introduce and they were all of those texts were in Hebrew so the ones that you have in Hebrew you have to put in the two hard basket until they're clarified and verified but the ones that are in Aramaic which was the original language are said to be the genuine ones that are there but yes there was an uh, there was a Hebrew version but the this one the wisdom of the Zohar which is the book that Elizabeth Frey Hoffett uses that one was taken from the Aramaic text mostly there are a few bits from the Hebrew text, but mostly from the Aramaic text. And so were the Sefer Yeritza and the Baha. They were taken from the Aramaic text. Texts. <laughs> Great. Helen. Yes, hi, thank you. My question is about the, um, what do you call it? Cosmic catastrophe. So is that something like um, worse than say, a planet being blown up i mean can you describe for me catastrophe that means just a, a huge imbalance or um a destruction of some kind um putting it simply is the amount of light that we receive from ein Sof is less than one seventh which he designed to give us one of the reasons there is so little light available is because Kut is not in her correct position She's not next to Tiferet. They're not joined together anymore because of that. It was Elizabeth Clare Prophet who described it as a cosmic catastrophe because it, had those two stayed in union, we would have had more access to light and a greater amount, and we would have been able to hold greater amounts of light too. The separation of the two separated the manufacture of souls. It separated the abundance of light. And also, of course, Malkut is the one by which we grow grasp to go back up. So the separation from of Malkut from Tiferet meant that it's more difficult for us to get into Malkut. And when we do, we need that protective garment that I mentioned called the Chasmal, which is created again, and this is another Bina Hotmar conjoining at the meeting place. And they make, it's kind of like when you grasp the the Malkut, it's kind of like one of those old-fashioned pinball machines and you're going to leave and everything lights up. When a human being on the way back to God grasps Malkut, everything lights up, the entire tree lights up because they are all so joyful and so glad that we're going back that way. But we need a garment. We need a garment to be protected. And Hokmar and Bina come together at that meeting place and they create, Chaz means speaking, Mal means silent. Bina is speaking. Hakma is silence. It's undifferentiated wisdom. And when they come together, you have a garment called the chasmal. And the chasmal is sent straight down the center of the tree. And we are covered and encased within that chasmal during the time that we are within the tree. I think sometimes that chasmal is the tube of light. I think sometimes if you refer to the uh, decree 50.01, the mother of the world has ordained, it says in there she has cloaked herself in a fiery shield. And Ezekiel saw the chasmal in the fire before his visions. 
So there's a, the chair smile is a, a very important part of doing it. That cosmic catastrophe made that entry into the tree far more difficult for us. So we had to be protected. So it was a cosmic catastrophe in many different fields. Thank you for your answer. Appreciate that. You're welcome. So, and um, can you can you explain again the cosmic catastrophe? How did that happen? Adam, in his adoration of Malcourt, adored her to the exclusion of all other spherot. That's why I just when I answered Robin, we don't pray to one spherot. We pray, uh, you know, we use we don't pray to them. They are the faces of God. They are not God. They are faces of God. So we don't pray to them, but we ask to use them like a postman. We ask them to send our messages to God. If we have a request for healing or something like that, then we can use them that way. When the when Adam he was in the Garden of Eden, there were three sins that he, in Kabbalah says that he's um, accused of. The first one was his adoration of Malkut. And he adored her so much to the exclusion of everything else. It was a, created a great imbalance in the chart because you see all of the light that's coming down through Malkut, Adam was tapping into that and not much of it was getting beyond that point but also the light any light that was going back when people were going back they found it very difficult to do that because Adam has completely encased Malkut it's sort of kid this is my words not Kabbalah it's sort of kidnapped her and held her for himself because that's what he wanted. His adoration for her was so great. And it, so to stop this happening, Malkut was separated from the tree and sent to a lower level. That was the separation was the cosmic catastrophe. So Malkut was Eve? Was what, sorry? Eve, Eve, like Adam and Eve. Was that Eve, his wife? No, that, no, that wasn't Eve. No. That was some things. Eve is, uh, Eve is slightly different. You remember when we started this, I said some of the keys are the fact there were two creations and there were two Adams. Well, Eve comes into that Adam up there, but not into the Eve. I don't know whether this cosmic catastrophe occurred before Eve or after Eve, but it may well be that because of the cosmic catastrophe that the God decided to, um, you know, to create Eve as a mate for Adam. I don't know that. That's me. I, that's not Kabbalah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Rosalinda. Thank you. I have a question, but before I ask it, I want to make a comment from your last description. And it sounds like when God gave you commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's what it reminded me of your dis your description. I absolutely. In that commandment. Yes. Yes, but my absolutely. yes. Thank you. My question is about the early communities. You had the Essene community that Jesus was part of, and then the Jewish Shangri La. Where are yes. those communities now, and what turned off? Some Jewish people don't acknowledge uh, the teaching on Kabbalah, and some do. Can you comment on that? Thank you. Absolutely. It's a, it's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, those communities, are, uh, the community of Sfat is still there today. Uh, we had lunch in a restaurant when I heard people talking about uh, Reuben and all sorts. Of, I couldn't help it. And Larry, my husband, gets very upset with me and accuses me of, of <laughs> interrupting other people's conversations. But I had to just speak up and say, I'm, excuse me, but I, I study ancient religions and I'm very interested in Kabbalah. And I heard you speaking about Sfat. And he said, yes, we've just come back from there. And he, he gave me a full description and told me all about Sfat, which was just wonderful. So it's still there today. It's still a school of Kabbalah. There are still many, many rabbis there who go there for learning. The Ascends, not so much so. There is a small conclave of Ascends where people can go and learn about the Ascend tribe and the, the, their rules and their regulations, which were basically the same as Kabbalah anyway. Nobody has ever said that they are part of, that they are the same thing, but as part of that thing there. And uh, but they are still there today. Um, why people went off Kabbalah was basically because when in the 13th century people were persecuted, they went through what is called the four deaths. And uh, the Kabbalists were said to be magic. They labeled uh, the authorities and particularly um, in the Spanish Inquisition and places like that. So Kabbalah went underground. 
And when it went underground, they put all these rules and regulations in. So to learn Kabbalah, you had to be over 70 years of age. You had to be male. You had to be uh, well versed in all of the things that you'd done. So your career and your family life were behind you. And you had to be able to have like two or three witnesses who said, yes, this is a man of reasonable character and we will teach him Kabbalah. To get into a school of Kabbalah during those times was excruciatingly different. And sometimes there were only three people in the school. And so when it went underground, there was a prophecy that in the final days, they, Kabbalah would make a comeback. Well, here we are, folks. <laughs> <laughs> we're making the comeback <laughs> you are and we thank you for that <laughs> okay i'll read two more comments out of the chat and then we're going to close so um don said thank you and that's very interesting and helpful god bless you and your good work and and trinidad says her nutrition mentor years ago in bozeman montana is an essene priest mike chad i'm not sure his last name he worked for another Essene priest, Dr. Gabriel Cousins, MD of the Tree of Life Nutrition School. He taught the Kabbalah and recited the yad heh only in Hebrew, which he said was more powerful than the English words. Would you agree with that? Well, well I would agree with it, but nevertheless, uh, have a little bit of power is better than no power at all, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. I agree with that. So thank you so much for being with us. This is wonderful. You are a great resource for Kabbalah. We might have to come back and tell us some more about it another time. But next month, we're going to have Moni Gulick here talking about the spiritual principles of the Constitution. And that'll be on the 18th of September. So God bless everyone. Uh, it's great to see you. Thank you so much, Anne. We are truly thank appreciative you. and glad to add you to our community of uh, presenters. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, everybody who joined. And thank you to all the people who helped make this possible to Linda and Rosa.